From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. Tom Faccio heard the knock at the kitchen door. He arose from his seat at the dinner table and peered out a window to see a plump teenager with a cute face looking back at him. He probably wondered what the young girl wanted and opened the door to see if she needed help. It was the worst and the last mistake Tom Faccio ever made. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting to you from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. The phenomenon of teenagers acting badly is nothing new, and neuroscientists now better understand the differences between the brain of a juvenile and the brain of an adult. The prefrontal cortex has not fully developed in young brains, and the rational part of a young person's brain may not fully develop until age 25. The prefrontal cortex controls a human's ability to stop and think before acting. It allows a person to contemplate the risks and consequences of his planned actions and consider other options. In a teenager's brain, the amygdala, the emotional part of the brain, is not fully connected to the prefrontal cortex, the brain's decision-making center. These neuroscience findings make it difficult for a judge to decide whether a teen should be tried as a juvenile or as an adult. Friends and families of the victims, though, understandably want the juvenile tried as an adult and sentenced to the maximum prison time possible. I've written and talked about several instances where a teenager was the killer. Evan Ramsey in Bethel claimed he thought those he shot would be able to get up and walk away once he ended his rampage. The teens who killed David Grunwald gave little thought to how they would escape justice. Denali Bremer thought that if she killed her best friend, a stranger would send her $9 million and she would walk away from her problems. None of these kids were thinking clearly, and their actions caused people to die. Whether or not their brains are fully formed, most teens don't commit murder. 14-year-old Winona Fletcher is the youngest juvenile ever tried as an adult in Alaska. Her cherubic face and sad background caused some to cry out for leniency, but her brutal actions forced the judge to send her to adult court. Tom Faccio moved his family to Alaska from California in 1949. He originally came to Alaska to build military housing for Elmendorf Air Force Base, but he soon noticed that Anchorage needed a good plumbing and heating supply store. So he began Tom's Plumbing and Heating on Mountain View Drive. Tom had an outgoing, friendly personality, and he catered to his customers. Tom did very well with his store, and as his profits grew, he bought several other businesses in Anchorage, Kenai, and Arizona. He also owned oil wells in Kentucky. The Fachos built a beautiful tri-level home in East Anchorage. Their home sat on a hill and bordered Russian Jack Springs Park. The location of their home provided seclusion and tranquility in the middle of a bustling city. The inside of the house was almost magical, with an Italian crystal chandelier, a sweeping staircase, a cascading waterfall, a gymnasium, a barbecue pit, and a weather room where you could get a suntan or enjoy indoor rainfall. The house's interior seemed so beautiful that there was little reason to leave it. A sophisticated burglar alarm protected the home, but the family only activated it when they left the house. They never used it when they were home. 
At the time of Tom's death at age 69, he and Anne were quite wealthy. Anne Faccio was 70, and Amelia Elliott was 76 when they died. Amelia was Anne's sister, and after she retired as a nurse, she moved in with Tom and Anne to keep Anne company when Tom was away for business. Tom and Anne Faccio had three children. Their oldest, Janice, was married to Wayne Leinhart, the manager of Tom's Plumbing and Heating. The youngest daughter, Sharon, married Harry Nahorny, a local dentist. When Janice and Sharon were nearly grown, Tom and Anne adopted a baby boy who was a son of a distant relative. They named him Tom Jr., but he did not resemble his adopted father. Tom Jr. was an angry young man who was arrested several times for drunk driving and bar fights. At the time of the elder Tom's death, the father and son were estranged. Young Tom lived in a cabin near the Faccio's home, and Anne slipped him food and supplies. But the two men could not be in the same room without a fight erupting between them. On the afternoon of April 22, 1985, Anne accompanied her daughter Janice to the Muldoon Community Assembly, where they watched Janice's 15-year-old daughter Tamara sing in a choir competition. Amelia stayed home to tend the garden, and Tom was at Tom's Plumbing and Heating, where he usually worked at the customer service counter, aiding contractors in purchasing their supplies. Janice remembered dropping off her mother at the Faccio home around 5 p.m. Young Tom Faccio stopped by the house a short while later. Anne gave him some chicken and told him to leave before his father got home. When Tom Sr. arrived home, Anne and Amelia had already eaten and were watching the evening news. Anne served Tom a salad, soup, and the remaining chicken. A knock on the kitchen door interrupted Tom's dinner. He cautiously looked out the window and saw the sweet face of a young woman standing on his porch. He opened the door and noticed the twenty two caliber pistol in the girl's hands. Soon, a young man wearing a ski mask and brandishing a larger gun pushed into the house. When Janice was homeschooling her youngest child the following morning, the phone rang. The caller was her husband, and he sounded upset. A representative from the Anchorage Police Department had just called him at work to tell him that someone had murdered Anne and Tom Faccio and Amelia Elliott in their home. Their bodies were discovered by Tom Jr. when he stopped by the house earlier in the day. Janice Leinhart did not believe the news. She sped across town to her parents' house and was met by members of the Anchorage Homicide Response Team. The police explained that someone had shot her parents and aunt to death. The killer had fired bullets at close range through their skulls. Janice's sister Sharon was visiting friends in Baltimore when she heard the news. It took her three days to return to Anchorage and reunite with her sister. The murders of the Faccios shocked the city of Anchorage. They were a well-known couple who had lived in the city for 36 years. Detectives scoured the murder scene, but they found few clues. They noted fingerprints, possibly belonging to the killer, but the prints were not in police files. Investigators estimated that the crime took approximately 45 minutes. If robbery was the motive for the home invasion and murders, the robber did not do a very good job. Tom Faccio died with $2,000 in his pockets, and the murderer left several firearms and valuable jewelry untouched. Suspicion initially fell on Tom Jr. Not only was he the first person on the scene of the murders, but he and his father had a contentious relationship. Tom Jr. was known for his temper and his propensity for violence. Did he and his father argue, causing Tom Jr. to snap and kill everyone in the house? The police put Tom Jr. at the top of their list, and even his sisters suspected he might have been responsible for the killings. Tom Jr. volunteered to take two lie detector tests, and he passed them both. Police had no evidence against him, so they cleared him as a suspect. 
Crime Stoppers in Anchorage put up a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of anyone involved in the murders at the Faccio home. The Faccio daughters quickly raised the reward to $50,000. The large reward for information caused the telephones to ring nonstop at police headquarters, and investigators followed numerous false leads. Finally, though, the reward paid off. 19-year-old Cordell Boyd's former cellmate recorded a phone conversation with Boyd where Boyd described the murders in the Faccio household in detail. The police finally had the break they needed in the case. I want to pause for a minute and thank Magic Mind, the sponsor for this episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I've been trying Magic Mind for about a week now, and I'm truly impressed with it. I need a clear head and a sharp mind when I research and write my true crime stories and when I write my novels. I'm not a coffee drinker, so I don't get a caffeine jolt in the mornings. I used to drink Diet Colas, but they were hard on my stomach. I was fascinated when I heard about Magic Mind and excited when my first shipment arrived. Each little plastic bottle contains a green shot of liquid. Since it's green, I expected it to taste bad, but it has a sweet, pleasant flavor. So I chugged my first bottle of Magic Mind and went about my day. I noticed that I felt good and had more energy than usual, but I thought maybe it was a coincidence. Perhaps I was just having a good day, and it had nothing to do with Magic Mind. I continued to drink Magic Mind for the next few days and knew my sharpened focus and increased energy must be related to this elixir. And amazingly, the effects lasted all day. I studied the ingredients in the green liquid and was intrigued by what Magic Mind contains. It has matcha, a natural extended-release version of caffeine. It also has a new tropic known to improve your attention span and your memory, as well as ramp up your ability to learn and process new information. Ashwagandha, another ingredient, reduces stress and anxiety. Rhodiola rosea reduces fatigue and anxiety and improves physical and mental endurance. Two other nootropics reduce anxiety and inflammation, reduce neural degeneration, and strengthen your immune system. I know I feel more focused and relaxed after taking Magic Mind, and if you sometimes fight brain fog like I do, I encourage you to try Magic Mind. To learn more about Magic Mind, its ingredients, and the story behind its development, go to www.magicmind.co slash murder and mystery. That's www.magicmind, M-A-G-I-C-M-I-N-D dot co dot C-O, not dot com, forward slash murder and mystery, M-U-R-D-E-R, a-N-D-M-Y-S-T-E-R-Y. Visit the website soon within the next 10 days and get 50% off your subscription of Magic Mind by using the code Murder and Mystery. That's all caps and no spaces M U R D E R A N D M Y S T E R Y. If you can't write this address and code down right now, you can find it in the show notes for this episode. I can't wait to hear how Magic Mind works for you. Winona Fletcher had a horrible childhood. Her mother left home and got married when she was 15 years old, and Winona was born before her mother turned 16. A few years later, Winona's parents divorced, and Winona, her little brother, and her mother lived with relatives. Winona's mother battled alcoholism, and she gave Winona her first drink of alcohol when the child was only six years old. Winona tried marijuana a year later. According to Winona, by the time she was 12 years old, she drank six or seven beers a day and often worked as a prostitute. 
By age 14, she drank a third of a bottle of rum every day. Winona craved attention and approval. When high school dropout Cordell Boyd walked into her life, she believed she finally found what she needed. Winona and Boyd worked together to burglarize homes. They stole money and items of value, and they took any weapons they found. They weren't very good burglars, though, and they were arrested several times. They lived in an abandoned apartment near the Faccio home, and the big house intrigued them. It was a nice home in a secluded area, and they knew the occupants of the house were elderly. They thought they could score money and expensive items from the house, but they would have to come up with a plan to get through the door and into the residence. Boyd thought Winona's innocent face was their ticket into the home. The night before their planned invasion of the Faccio home, Winona said she dropped acid. When she woke up the following morning, she ate, drank a couple glasses of rum, smoked a joint, and took some Valium. Then she and Cordell walked to the Faccio home. Cordell pulled a ski mask over his face when they reached the house and hid while Winona knocked on the door and smiled. When Tom opened the door, the two young people pushed into the house. Winona's and Boyd's version of the events vary. Cordell claims he did not want to kill anyone, but Winona said they had to die because they saw her face. In a jailhouse interview, Winona said, He told me I had to kill them so they could not identify me. Whichever one first decided to kill Tom, Ann, and Amelia, the other one unhesitatingly agreed with the plan. Boyd rounded up the three residents at the house and brought them into the dining room. Winona held the hostages at gunpoint while Boyd searched for something to restrain them. He returned to the dining room with several of Tom's neckties and bound their wrists. Anne looked pale and began showing signs of distress, and Winona and Boyd thought she was having a heart attack. Boyd told Winona to take her up to one of the bedrooms. When Winona forced Anne into a bedroom, Anne fell to her knees and began praying for Winona and begging for Winona to spare her life. Winona resented the older woman praying for her, and she leveled her pistol and fired around. The bullet missed Anne and Winona laughed. She placed the barrel of the gun next to Anne's head. She said, shut up, bitch, and then fired again. Tom Faccio called out to his wife, but Boyd told him that Winona had just shot her. Winona came downstairs, and according to her testimony, she then shot Amelia Elliott, and Cordell shot Tom twice. The first shot to the chest did not immediately kill Tom, so Cordell shot him in the head. In interviews, Winona sometimes said she shot Tom first, and then Cordell shot him because the first bullet did not kill him. The police were never sure whether Winona or Cordell murdered Tom. Due to the horrendous nature of Winona's actions when she callously shot Anne Faccio, Amelia Elliott, and Tom Faccio, the state filed a petition for waiver of juvenile jurisdiction over Winona Fletcher. The Faccio daughters were excluded from the hearing in juvenile court, and they were furious to learn that the system favored the rights of the juvenile perpetrator over the rights of the victim's family. Cordell Boyd testified against Winona at the hearing. He said he did not want to kill anyone, but Winona told him she was willing to kill them. Judge Carl Johnstone, who presided over the hearing, found that Fletcher was not forced, coerced, induced, or under influence by Boyd when she shot Anne Faccio and Amelia Elliott. The judge also concluded that there was probable cause to believe Fletcher committed first-degree murder in the killings of Mr. Faccio, Ms. Faccio, and Ms. Elliott. Five mental health professionals testified at the hearing. Four out of the five said Winona had a moral deficiency causing her to lack normal emotional feelings. They believed an individual with her personality features had a poor prognosis for rehabilitation. 
If Fletcher was tried in juvenile court and found guilty, she could only be held until her 20th birthday. Judge Johnstone did not believe she could be rehabilitated in such a short period of time. He therefore waived juvenile jurisdiction over Fletcher and sent her to adult court. Winona was indicted on three counts of first-degree murder, and she pleaded no contest to two counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. The judge sentenced her to three consecutive terms of 99 years of imprisonment for each count, totaling 297 years. The court later reduced her sentence to three 45-year terms, totaling 135 years. She will be eligible for parole in 2031 when she is 60. Boyd was sentenced to 99 years in prison. He was denied parole in 2018. Winona tried but failed to appeal her conviction, alleging that the mental health professionals would have changed their opinions if they'd had access to recent research showing how long it takes for the rational part of a brain to develop. Once Winona's prefrontal cortex had fully formed, her decision-making skills improved, and she could have rejoined society as an adult. Some of the doctors who had initially said Winona had a poor prognosis for rehabilitation agreed with Winona. One doctor said if he'd had the new juvenile brain development research, the data would have affected his findings. Winona would have a stronger case for an appeal if she had a better prison record. She somehow managed to have two babies while incarcerated, even though sex is not permitted in prison. The babies were immediately removed from Winona and given to her mother to raise. Janice Leinhardt's and Sharon Nahorny's forced introduction to the Alaska judicial system appalled them. The system was aimed at protecting the accused and gave the victims few rights. Their dismay began when they were banned from attending Winona's juvenile waiver hearing. Janice and Sharon hired an attorney to help them win access to the hearing. The attorney later said the sisters injected the human side of the victim into the process. They told the court, we're human beings. We want to understand this system. We need to know what happened to our family. Janice and Sharon were emboldened by this victory to bend the system so they could watch the juvenile proceedings. They made it their mission to start a victim's rights movement throughout Alaska. They formed the organization Victims for Justice and changed how the state treats victims. They fought to make Alaska's law stricter and more pro-victim. In 1989, the legislature expanded the definition of victim to include people close enough to the victim to be emotionally devastated by the crime. Before this change, a person had to suffer physical injury to be classified as a victim. Legislation was also passed to allow victims to speak at sentencing hearings in otherwise private criminal juvenile trials. In 1991, the state legislature cleared the way for fingerprinting juveniles, just as adult offenders are fingerprinted. Over the years, Janice Leinhardt and Sharon Nahorny did a great deal to change the justice system in Alaska for the better. But they did not spend all their time talking to legislators. They put themselves on the front lines to help victims of violent crime navigate the system. In so many of the podcast episodes I've researched and written, Janice and Sharon's names have popped up. Both sisters stayed by John Newman's side during the trial for Kirby Anthony. Kirby Anthony was Newman's nephew, and while Newman was out of town, Anthony brutally raped and murdered Newman's wife and two small daughters. Janice and Sharon also supported Dave and Valerie LaMare, whose daughter was raped and shot near Glen Allen. When Karen Foster was denied a copy of her daughter's autopsy findings, Janice Leinhart fought for her right to see it, and Karen finally read the document and spoke with the medical examiner. Time after time, Janice and Sharon have helped other victims maneuver the justice system so they would know their rights. They said their goal was to help victims get through the agony of grief 
and the rigors of trial. As time passes, younger generations of the Faccio family make it their job to do all they can to ensure Winona and Boyd remain in prison. Children behaving badly is nothing new, but few children would force their way into someone's house and murder three people. Alaskans can sleep a little safer at night knowing Winona Fletcher and Cordell Boyd are still safely behind bars. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. If you haven't already done it, be sure to join the Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier Facebook group and chat about the podcast. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. Thank you.